Um, Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome everyone to Buy Data Jeddah kickoff webinar. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I'm Yasmin Al Saadi, and here with me Hassan Al Sawadi and Abdul Ilah Al Misfer. And from behind the scenes, Afnan Al Shahri, Najla Bin Baz, the Buy Data Jeddah team. Today we have two speakers, Yahya and Adrian. But before we get started, I would like to briefly talk about Buy Data. So. Who we are, what is BiData? BiData is an educational program run by NumFocus that supports open source software. BiData aims to bring together users and developers of data analysis tools such as Python, R, Julia, etc. That's why BiData have more than 100 local groups. And here we are, BiData Zidda. Uh, what we do, we arrange local meetups to talk about interesting topics and tools. Hopefully we can arrange in-person meetups when this pandemic is over. Okay, if you wanna learn more about BiData, you can visit the website bydata.org and follow us on Twitter, bydata Jeddah, to know our upcoming um, meetup. So thank you for your attention. And one last thing, if you have any questions, we encourage you to write your question down below in Q&A chat and Hassan will pass it to our speakers uh, at the end of, uh, of his talk. Feel free to write your question in Arabic and we will do our best to translate it in English uh, to our speakers. Um, I think this is from my side. So yeah, here you can share your screen and start whenever you are ready. Uh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, Yasmin, Abdelilah, Hassan, and the whole PyData team for this. I, it's a truly a privilege and I'm happy to be here with all of you. So let's get started. Uh, so let me check first, uh, can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, perfect. So, uh, and also on the questions, it's okay if you, if you ask them in Arabic. I've, I think I can figure it out. So don't worry about the translation. Uh, so my name is Yahya Khoja. Uh, it's a pleasure again to be here. Uh, I don't want to say too much about myself because I'm going to have a slight uh, intro slide about myself. But uh, as you can see in front of you, our talk today will be about autonomous vehicles. Um, and we're particularly, we're going to talk about data management and model development for autonomous vehicles. Uh, my objective for this talk is to show you why is it challenging. Um, some might be asking, oh, it's 2020, by now we expected to see flying cars, not just self-driving cars. Um, it's, it's a little more tricky and we'll see that together. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I hope that I could inspire some of you to join the effort to build autonomous vehicles, inshallah. So uh, again, um, I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm definitely excited for it. So again, thanks to the PyData Jidda team. Uh, and all PyData teams who make, uh, make things like this happen, which is quite exciting. So let's get started. As I promised, uh, I'll share a little bit about myself. So I started uh, by studying electrical engineering at Purdue University. Uh, I was sponsored by Aramco at the time. So naturally, once I graduated, I went back to Aramco to work. And uh, I started my career at Aramco as a data networks engineer. So I was doing routing, switching, data networks, laying fiber optic cable and whatnot. And of course, like any good Aramco employee, I spent some time in the desert and made it back in one piece, which is usually the outcome you would hope for. Uh, and after that, I got second deed or loaned by Aramco to the Ministry of Energy to work on the Saudi Energy Efficiency Program at the time, which eventually spun off to become the Saudi Energy Efficiency Center. So I worked there for about three years uh, before I started applying to grad school and alhamdulillah got accepted into Stanford. Uh, so I went to Stanford and got my joint degrees. Uh, I got an MBA and a master's in electrical engineering. At that time I focused more on artificial intel intelligence. So I uh, did a lot of deep learning work and computer vision. And uh, luckily I got the opportunity in my summers to intern at Amazon. So I worked with their last mile technology group uh, where we used deep learning to predict delivery times of packages uh, to give a more delightful experience for our customers. And I've also had the opportunity to work with a couple of AI startups uh, in the Valley. Uh, but after I graduated from Stanford, I spent most of my time full-time working at NVIDIA 
and uh, I work there with their AI infrastructure group building autonomous vehicles. So most of what you'll see here today uh, is definitely based on my NVIDIA experience. Um, and please don't take that to be gospel by any means. Uh, a AVs or autonomous vehicles is still definitely an open problem. It does not have one solution uh, or one size fits all. So it's still an open game and there's always consistent and constant innovation and uh, new ideas coming up. And last but not least, alhamdulillah, I came back and uh, moved back to Saudi Arabia with my family. Uh, so I live in Riyadh now, I'm originally from Jeddah and then spent some time in the Eastern province and now live in Riyadh. So one of the things that I do really brag about and very happily and proudly is that I lived in the three big cities in Saudi Arabia. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, and I work for the Ministry of Energy. I started there since uh, January of this year. So came back, it's been six months now. Uh, it feels already like six years. Uh, there's a lot of work and exciting work happening at the Ministry of Energy. Hopefully you'll, you'll hear more about it uh, soon, inshallah. So great, that's about me. Uh, let's now look at what exactly uh, are we gonna see in this presentation. Uh, so I want to start off with an overview about AVs. Um, maybe some are already quite familiar with them. Maybe others don't. Um, so just a little primer to get us warmed up. And then I want to uh, give an overview of the AV development cycle. And that's where we're gonna see the steps that are needed and also the scale uh, of developing autonomous vehicles. Uh, and it, hopefully that's the first glance at how uh, challenging this can be. Then we're going to look at data management and of course, AV model development. And lastly, I'll share some closing thoughts and then we'll open it for questions which I'm excited about. So that being started, let's start with our overview. And I think a good question or a good place to start is saying, okay, where, where did all of this AV hype start really? Um, and it really depends on what you read or who you ask. Some things I saw online said that, oh, Leonardo da Vinci created the first design for an autonomous cart that would self-propel itself, uh, which is interesting, but uh, I mean, compared to the technology you see today, is also not that exciting. But uh, no offense to Leonardo da Vinci fans out there. Uh, but then there are others that have done similar work uh, that built, uh, built up to what we see today. Of course, like any great innovation or research project, it's always an accumulation of multiple people's work and multiple people's efforts from around the globe. So it's really no one person's effort that got us to where we are here today. But I would say that a, a, a big turning point was when DARPA in the United States, which is the Defense Advanced Research uh, something something, uh, created the DARPA Grand Challenge, which is essentially an autonomous vehicle challenge where they uh, asked researchers uh, in the US or different engineering teams in the US to come up with an autonomous vehicle that would cross a track of about 150 or 140 miles in the desert fully autonomously. And it would have, I think, 24 hours to cross uh, that track. So the DARPA Grand Challenge, I think, was announced in 2012. The very first race was in 2004. Uh, I think there were over 20 different teams that submitted their designs and vehicles and were excited to get started. But the end result of that year was that no one, no one passed the challenge. Everyone failed. I think the best car that got the furthest uh, only crossed about seven to 10 miles. So that's even less than 10% of the full track. And, uh, and then it got stuck uh, on a rock. So everyone failed that year. So uh, no one won the prize. The prize was about a million dollars. So it was quite material and substantial. Uh, so what DARPA did was relaunch the challenge for next year. They said, okay, all the teams can go. Um, rethink your research, um, kind of revamp your, your vehicles and come back next year and let's see what you got. Now, next year, uh, what happened, I think all but four teams were able to cross uh, or beat the best score of seven miles of last year. And I think about four to six teams were able to actually complete the full course of 140 miles or 150 miles uh, in the desert. And that's just in a span of one year. So I would say that's quite of a fascinating feat for multiple teams from different research institutes or universities uh, to come together and actually be able to beat the record uh, of last year and also complete the full course. Uh, and from there, you can see 
Now, I'll go to the picture I just showed and then come back to this one. You can see that even just looking at the number of logos on the picture, that the hype of AV started. So look at the number of logos you see on this vehicle and the amount of logos you see on this vehicle. You can already see people are investing, Android is slapped on there, Intel, uh, Stan this was the, the vehicle for the Stanford team, probably Volkswagen donated their vehicle, uh, so that's why they have their logos all over the place, and Red Bull for some reason are in there. So you can already see what I'm trying to get at is this started the uh, thinking about AVs, the, that there's promise behind this technology and idea, and people started to invest in it, uh, researchers started to work on it, and people started to get more excited about it. And I think another cool event, fast forward to 2015, was when Tesla overnight released the autopilot to all Tesla owners through a software update. So this is almost like you updating your, your apps or how your phone would auto update some apps while you're asleep. Imagine your car doing that while you're asleep. And the day before it couldn't drive itself and now you wake up and all of a sudden the car can drive itself. And this was quite revolutionary, and not just in the area of autonomous vehicles, but also in the auto industry, to be able to give and provide such a, um, I don't know, mind-blowing feature just through a software update. Uh, and we'll talk more about Tesla and also their over-the-air stuff and work uh, in a bit when we talk about data collection. Now, before I finish my overview, I want to give you a glimpse on the landscape of AVs. Um, and this might be outdated already. Um, and you'll see a number of these. There's always a company or a VC arm that's trying to consolidate and create an image like this. And I think what's more interesting besides the image or the actual accuracy or exhaustiveness of this image is looking at the bigger categories uh, in this AV landscape. So you see some people are building uh, complete autonomous driving systems like Uber, Zooks, and by the way, Zooks just got acquired by Amazon. So Amazon is now also in the autonomous vehicle race. Um, you have people building actual cars and manufacturers like Tesla. Uh, you have people building data and simulation tools. Some people building lighting uh, detection or sensors. Others just building software. So there's, it's such a big problem that you could just take one piece of it and try to solve that and you would still be able to build a company uh, and create mass and create value within the ecosystem. And of course, we would expect a lot of, uh, a lot of consolidation to happen. So I wouldn't expect this once we reach a steady state that all of these companies would survive. Uh, most probably either some of them would die off or some of them will get acquired. Like uh, Mobileye got acquired by Intel. We, I just mentioned that Zooks got acquired by Amazon, Drive AI got acquired by Apple. Um, but it's also exciting to see that the big four uh, tech companies are all going into uh, the autonomous vehicle race. I think all of them are in there except for Facebook at the moment. So this concludes my overview of autonomous vehicles. Um, maybe last thing I'll say that uh, I'll just use myself as an example. I personally wasn't into AI before I started working at NVIDIA. Uh, I thought it was a hyped up project or idea that everyone was excited about, but it was really nothing there. But when I started to work on it firsthand and started to see uh, the engineering complexity and the amount of work and effort, uh, and actually one of my colleagues or coworkers compared this to launching a rocket to the moon, um, it, it was actually quite exciting. So I hope you get to see that as well as we uh, get, go through the next coming slides. So now let's talk about the AV development cycle. And now that we've talked about, okay, the, the history of it, where did it come from, where did it start, what does the landscape look like? Uh, let's now think, okay, if we wanna build a autonomous vehicle that can drive safely on the road, follow traffic rules, uh, avoid accidents, of course, and also needs to provide some form of smooth, uh, reasonably enjoyable ride to the consumer or customer, um, this is the cycle that we would follow. So you would of course have your AV. Naturally, like any machine learning or AI or deep learning project, you would start with your data collection. But there are a few more steps here. So you'll, you'll start with data collection and then we will select uh, data from the raw data that we've collected. And we'll start labeling that data so then we can start developing models. 
and then uh, we'll move from developed models to testing those models. Uh, and testing models is probably the most important step or most crucial or critical step within this whole process, uh, simply because of the uh, paramount importance of safety within autonomous vehicles. And lastly, uh, no matter what amount of testing you would do uh, on test data or through simulation or on the bench, you would need to deploy your models to the vehicle and actually see how they perform uh, on the road. Now, you can already see that there is some complexity, it's multiple steps, there are a couple of feedback loops in there. So after you test a model or you deploy it, you come back to select more data because you see that your model is failing here or there. Um, so you bring more data in there that would improve your model's performance. So it's kind of relatively complex, but what would really, uh, what really made me see the complexity of this is the size or the sheer scale of this effort. So when I started to learn or work on this, the, the amount of data we collect reaches one petabyte per month. One petabyte per month. This is a lot of information that you're collecting. Uh, and then uh, in the end, you end up with a data lake that houses about 10 upwards to 100 petabytes of raw data. So this is data that you need to index. You would need to make it available to your model developers somehow. You'll even need to know which of this, you're not gonna use all of this data for your model development, so you need to select the best frames that would improve the performance of your model. And then of course, once you select your data, you would start to label your data. Uh, you would end up with millions of labeled images for different tasks, which some of which you will see in a bit. Uh, and then hundreds of developers can start developing your models using thousands of GPUs. Um, lastly, as I mentioned, you'll start testing your models. You have thousands of hours of video testing data. Um, we also have at NVIDIA had uh, a product called uh, NVIDIA Constellation, which is essentially a simulation tool that builds realistic footage uh, and simulation uh, to test also your data. And lastly, you would deploy tens of models that work with and interact with multiple sensors in the vehicle uh, to test it on the road. So uh, this truly is why AV is such a complex uh, case. And the reason why you're collecting uh, such, such a huge amount of data and doing all of this development and testing is again, back to the point of safety. Um, if you've uh, recently, I think two to three weeks ago, uh, a video started to, to, to kind of go viral of a, of a Tesla that uh, there was a truck overturned in the middle of the highway. Uh, it was, the truck was laying on its side and a Tesla Model 3 was coming in on autopilot and it just crashed into that truck. And just the question started to fly around, all around. Like, why didn't the Tesla recognize that this is an obstacle on the road and at least slow down or try to avoid it or uh, stop the vehicle completely? Uh, but the, the, the car just kept going and didn't even slow down, just completely went into the, the, the truck that was blocking the highway. Um, and of course, uh, I didn't follow the news. I, I hope uh, everyone kind of made it out there alive and no one was badly injured. But again, it poses the question, and this is essentially the, the, the main issue with AVs, is that no matter how much data you use and no matter how you train your models, you always worry about that one scenario, that very rare instance that was not part of your development data or test data that would uh, cause an accident and cause, God forbid, injury or even people to die. Uh, and this is why this is such a serious, serious problem. Okay, well, uh, no, I hope I didn't scare you off too much, uh, but we'll get to, to go deeper into each of these steps uh, and learn more about, okay, now that we know and understand that these are quite challenging tasks and steps, how, what do we do in order to solve them or how do we go about these challenges? So let's get into the data management piece. If you've noticed the cycle, probably the first six boxes uh, were related to data and then the remaining six were related to AV models. Uh, so let's start with uh, collecting data and data collection. And before we do that, uh, let's look at the types of sensors that we have in, in uh, AV uh, vehicles. So uh, we can see that, of course, you have your cameras. Uh, you also have radar center, uh, sensors that are around uh, the different corners of the vehicle. You would have multiple cameras. Some are front-facing, some are back-facing, others are to the side. 
uh, you would have your LIDAR, which is essentially a laser that just keeps spinning uh, and collecting information to see what is around you. And you would have different ranges of radar uh, as well. Um, of course, let's not forget that you would probably have a GPS tracker in there as well. Uh, you would have your uh, odometer as well to, to know the speed of the vehicle. All of these are, of course, standard for non-AV vehicles, but these are also sensory information that is important and goes into uh, building AV models later on. And last but not least, it's also important that, to remember that there's also a computer in this vehicle that does all the processing on the edge and in the vehicle in a matter of split seconds in order to do all the predictions, to recognize all obstacles or, uh, and all objects uh, and be able uh, to, to safely maneuver the vehicle on the road. So, okay, these are the numbers of sensors, but exactly how much data are we talking about? We said it's about a petabyte per month, which is a lot of data. Uh, but I found this uh, piece of information, it was quite fascinating, that an autonomous vehicle would collect about 4,000 gigabytes of data per day. Now, 4,000 gigabytes, and uh, I was curious to put that into scale, the average person, like any one of us, would be consuming about, let's say, 1.3 gigabytes per day of data on their phone. Now, so, so this would equal to the amount of data consumption uh, of people on their phone equal to 1,333 people. So this is a lot of data that we're talking about. And you can immediately see that it's no wonder that when you have a fleet of these vehicles, let's say 30 vehicles uh, collecting data over the course of the month, that you would end up with about a petabyte of data per month. <clears throat> So, okay, this is the amount of data that comes in, um, and, but, but how exactly does it happen and how do AVs collect that data? Now, from my experience, I've seen two models. And again, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, please don't take the information that I share with you that it's exhaustive and it's the only way to develop AVs or the only way to collect data. There are probably other people doing it differently out there. And remember that this is still an open problem with a lot of innovation going on to do things differently and more intelligently and quickly. So the example that we had in, at NVIDIA was similar to what I just described. We had about uh, a fleet of 30 uh, vehicles similar to this one. They would be scattered around the world. So a number of them would be in the US, some of them would be in Europe, some would be in Japan. The idea is to collect data from different geographies, uh, different traffic laws, different traffic signs, uh, and collect all of that information and consolidate it into one place. Now, the bigger challenge with this was how would we consolidate all of this data into one place? And uh, the solution was actually, or what, the process at NVIDIA was actually quite interesting. Each, each one of these vehicles would collect the data and obviously store it in a hard drive or an SSD. And then all of these hard drives would be FedExed back to a central location at NVIDIA, which is essentially the data center. It would take all of these hard drives, plug them into a central computer, and then download all of that information into that one place and have it stored there. Uh, so this was an interesting process. Obviously, it, it came with many challenges. Um, you can already imagine that doing this over the course of uh, many different uh, missions, or by mission I mean data collection missions, uh, would be, you would start to face a challenge with tracking all the information, so indexing it in a way that makes it easy to find, uh, being able to swift through the data, and we'll see that more in how we select data. So this was essentially the general case, as I mentioned. Then they would develop models, and let's say, for example, they realized that the model is not performing well in school zones where it would typically encounter traffic signs for school zones or school buses or children crossing or passing. So they would decide that on the next missions, we would want these cars to focus on driving more uh, around school zones. So we would collect more school zone data. So that's how they would go about it. It was definitely a lot of coordination, a relatively manual process uh, and definitely challenging. It came with its challenges. Uh, one, one funny challenge, which was actually quite frustrating at the time. Uh, I mean, you can, these vehicles aren't just plug and play. There's also a lot of calibration that goes into uh, setting the sensors properly. So then the sense before you can actually go and collect data. So in one instance, I think 
the right radar was incorrectly installed, installed on the left and the left radar was incorrectly installed on the right. But it was still collecting data and tagging it as uh, left and right. So it was very confusing. And then even worse, I think the radars themselves were turned upside down. So the full data set was just uh, a whole mess. And you can imagine how frustrating it is after a full month of collecting data and not being able to know which data is contaminated and which data needs to be fixed and which data is good to use. And then eventually wanting to release this uh, out in the wild so then it drives safely. Uh, it can get quite uh, intense. So let's look at another model. Uh, and, I would, and this is where I would want to talk about Tesla. Uh, Tesla, in my opinion, have a very, very interesting model. Uh, what they do is they actually now have a fleet of half a million cars around the world, which is essentially half a million Teslas that people bought and are now using and driving to run their daily errands. And what Tesla does is over the, uh, over the air, or in short, OTA, uh, data transfer. So let's say at the end of the day, um, this is Abdelilah's home and this is his car, he's parking back, uh, came back after a long day of, uh, of work. Uh, and now the car would just connect to the Wi-Fi at home and it would transfer the data that it saw for the day uh, back to Tesla's central data center. Uh, of course, there are privacy issues and Tesla was dealing around that. There's a talk for the AI director of Tesla, Andre Karpati, who described how the data is also anonymized. And essentially what they're looking at is not even taking the full images, but some sparse interpretation of the data to make it uh, less data consuming uh, to transfer that information. So having half a million people collecting data for you on let's say a relatively daily basis is a very, very good uh, position to be in. Now, the, the, the bigger advantage that I see with Tesla's model is what we just talked about, the rare instances that you would face along the road. Uh, and now with half a million cars driving around the world, uh, you would have a much higher likelihood of catching these rare instances, let's say like an animal crossing the road, or for example, seeing an oddly shaped vehicle like a uh, moving car, or if you're driving on the highway on the Eastern province, you would see a lot of trucks moving pipes and industrial sized equipment going back and forth between Jebel and Bahran and whatnot. So all of these would create some form of data points or information that the car would know how to handle and, and process. Uh, and Tesla is definitely better poised than many other AV developers uh, to, to be able to collect that information in these rare instances and tag them as a rare instance and then be able to process them and integrate them into their training data. So this is the, the first part, just talking about data collection and you can already judge by the amount of time that we spent on this portion alone. Uh, again, uh, just emphasizing the complexity of the process. Uh, so now let's move to the next piece of selecting data. And for this, I actually have a challenge for, for the dear audience. Uh, so this is a somewhat small-ish data set. This is about uh, 1,500 images. It's actually the same four images. I just copied and pasted them across the whole uh, screen and, and minimized them. So if I were to ask you, okay, uh, which pictures are during the day and which pictures are during the night, you can probably tell, it's not that bad. Uh, but let me ask you this, which pictures are on the highway and which pictures are in an urban area? Okay, which pictures have a bicycle in them? Or which pictures have a pedestrian crossing the road? Or a trailer in the vehicle? Now, take your best guess, choose, the pictures that you think have these things I mentioned, I'll show you the pictures in a minute. Uh, but what I'm trying to communicate and, and, and illustrate here is the challenge of, again, if you've collected 10 to 100 petabytes of raw data and raw images that you now want to go through and know which images to label in order to use to train your models, you're going to have a tough time knowing which ones to choose. So you, you'll need to have a system in place that does that automatically for you uh, and have somewhat of a, of a more of smarter way to select uh, the data. Uh, now, as promised, let me show you the images. These are essentially the four images I just showed. You can see that these two were in highway, these two were in urban areas. This guy here is, is uh, doing a wheelie in the middle of the night, in the middle of the road. Uh, this gentleman here is, I don't know, I don't even know what he's wearing, but 
but some form of stints. Uh, he's just using to cross a road and there's a trailer here pulling an ATV. Um, now, all of these data points might seem interesting, but I would say that for AV development, these are exactly the data points that you want. You want these rare instances of things that could happen uh, that your car will need to be able to handle safely. Your car will need to be able to look at night that there's someone on a bicycle and know not to hit that person or that there's someone wearing these weird, oddly shaped, whatever things, and you don't want to run them over even though they look very ridiculous. Uh, and there's this vehicle pulling a trailer, pulling an ATV, and you will need to handle that. And we just talked about the case of the Tesla that uh, crashed into a, uh, a truck that was lying on its side uh, on the road. So these are exactly, when you have millions and millions of data frames or images, these are the ones that you really want to capture and, and send to your, your label, labelers so then you can incorporate them into your uh, uh, model development. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so what do we do exactly to, to manage this? So how do we select the data that matters most? Uh, so there are various forms of data selection. Uh, the first and most obvious is to use metadata. So we just looked at the data that was happening during the night and ha data that was happening during the day, this one you can easily tell, right? Because you have the timestamps of the information or of the data that you collected. So from the timestamps, you can tell whether it was early in the morning, um, in the afternoon, or later in the, uh, at night, or in the middle of the night. Um, so time is one thing. Uh, you can also look at weather patterns and use that as metadata to enrich your data indexing. So you can tell, look at, for example, um, this actually brings me to the third point. So this is, I would consider third party data. So you can integrate your raw data set that you collected with a third party, like let's say a map provider. And they can tell you if you've passed under a bridge or if you were in a construction zone. Uh, or they can tell you, you can, for example, also pair it or enrich it with third-party data from a weather uh, forecast provider. And now your data, you can tell whether these data frames are happening uh, in clear weather or if they're happening while it's snowing or while it's raining uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and now you have a better, much better way to select data frames that would help you in your model development. And uh, lastly, uh, there's also a new field of research that's coming up called active learning. Uh, and this is also something that we started to experiment with at NVIDIA. We even started to incorporate it into our AV development. Essentially what this is, is that you start off with a set of training data that you already have, and you develop a model uh, that, based on that training data. And then you use that model on your raw data so your model will start to run inference uh, on the raw data. And from there, you see and pick the frames or data points on which your model performed worst. So you would actually pick those and send those to your data labelers. I'll actually share an example of active learning in the next slide to uh, illustrate how it works. So as I mentioned, uh, let's imagine that our task is to detect the lane markings uh, on the road, okay? So essentially, this is our training data. This is an image that we have. And this is uh, something that we already have in our training set that was manually labeled by a labeler. So you can see that the lane markings are very clean, uh, very uh, well put. So, uh, so that's the data that we start out with. We use this data to train a model. And as I mentioned, run it on the raw data. So you would then run inference on raw data frames that you have not labeled and see how your model performs. So we can see that uh, in this one, the model is not fully confident of the lane markings. We can see some kind of uh, yet bluish lines in the middle here. Uh, but on this data set or in this data point, the model is doing well already. Uh, so from this, we can tell that, okay, this is the data point or data frame that I want to include in my next uh, training cycle for this model because the model isn't performing well on this data point. So I want to send this to the data labelers and this would help my model perform better uh, next time it sees or encounters uh, this frame. So this is essentially how we would use active learning to select data intelligently. So as I mentioned a few times now, um, we go to data labeling, which is our next step. 
And this is a step that people often miss, uh, especially when you do the transition from academia to industry. Uh, usually in academia, you have kind of data sets that you could use starting from MNIST to ImageNet, or you go to a Kaggle competition and you have data that's readily labeled and you can just get started with your data exploration and also your model development. Uh, but this is rarely the, the situation uh, out in industry, uh, which is labeling data is a big challenge in itself. So how do we label data? Uh, at NVIDIA, we used to have something that we called the data factory. We employed 1,000 people in this data factory uh, in various roles, mostly uh, data labelers. So they would sit in front of a computer, look at raw images, and then they would be given a specific task, whether to draw bounding boxes around uh, objects on the image or define lane markings in the image, uh, or if it's a segmentation task, they would draw uh, polylines around the areas and also label or classify at the pixel level. Um, so it's a very laborious task. Um, we also had people that are doing quality assurance. Once you label, I don't know, a number of frames per day, it's very likely that you might make a mistake. Uh, it's very tiring and exhausting. Uh, and of course, we also had managers and supervisors there, mostly to ensure the continuity of people. I mean, this is a job that's uh, relatively stressful or not the most engaging or exciting. And we want to make sure that our employees stay there uh, and continue because it's also costly if someone leaves or quits and now we have to retrain someone else and then they, they need to ramp up time uh, to reach optimal performance or their best performance. Uh, so it is challenging. So we always wanted to make sure that our labelers are happy uh, and doing their best work. So how would we label data? Uh, you would have uh, what you would call a labeling project. I've already hinted at this. You would have all of this data collected, raw data, and let's say you would have a various task or various tasks that you want to have training data for, whether it's object detection or semantic segmentation, or you want to identify the traffic signs, or you want to work with the LIDAR data or point cloud segmentation and what have you. So all of these would essentially be a I would say that the bulk of the focus would typically always be these three, for sure. Uh, probably many people also include uh, LIDAR uh, data as well for training and labeling projects. Uh, and then what you would do, you would essentially have a data labeling instruction or guide or manual. Uh, now this goes into very fine detail into how exactly someone should label a data set. And here's an, an example. It's not from AV, but it is uh, essentially the same thing. So here it's just drawing a bounding box uh, around the fox. It shows you a correct example. It shows you incorrect examples and why they're incorrect. Because here the bounding box is not as tight as possible. Here the bounding box is too small. Uh, here this one is correct and this one is not correct because it is, uh, it's including the rock or uh, this log uh, that's not part of the fox's body. So you can see that you need to be as specific as possible uh, in order to have clear labeling instructions. And if these instructions aren't clear, your labeling isn't going to be good. If your labeling isn't good, your training data isn't going be, to be good. And eventually you'll be running into a garbage in, garbage out problem. Because if you don't have, if you have garbage training data, you're gonna have garbage output from your model, regardless of architecture, regardless whether you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow, garbage in means garbage out. So this was a very, very important, crucial, and critical part, and also time-consuming. So we would have this run for a whole month before we have training data that we could actually use uh, for model development. So this concludes the portion of the talk on data management, and now uh, we're heading to the AV models. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the various tasks, and I'll show a few models. Uh, I'll even have a video that I'll share with you that's publicly available. You can uh, watch the full video afterwards and then we'll finish off our talk and open for questions. So uh, let's talk about model development. I just wanna, okay. Uh, I can't see the time. So to the moderators, let me know if we're tight on time so then I can uh, go faster. Okay. So uh, talking about model development, what types of models do we need? Obviously in an autonomous vehicle, you don't just have one model that does everything. 
uh, you also might have multiple models that do the same exact function for redundancy purposes. They obviously do them in two different uh, implementations. And for that, just to bring the point across, I found this really cool and very true meme where people always think that AI is going to destroy the world. It's just this intelligent, sentient system and AVs are just going to do whatever they want. But the reality is, again, as we just talked, you always face issues with training data, finding the right data to train your model. Uh, and that's where you spend the bulk of your time. So with that being said, let's uh, look at various examples of AV models that we use. Uh, and you can probably predict already the various uh, tasks that we would want to have uh, in the AV. Uh, so obviously we'd have uh, object detection. We want to see the other vehicles, their road signs, uh, anything that's blocking the road. Uh, you would have semantic segmentation and we would see how we would apply that uh, in a bit. Uh, you would have, of course, classification. When I see a road sign, I want to know whether it's a stop sign, speed limit, uh, or a construction sign, for example. And one of the most challenging tasks of an AV is to actually predict what is going to happen in the road around you. When you see someone on the sidewalk, are they about to cross the street or are they just going to continue walking uh, down the sidewalk? Uh, and these are important things that we as humans uh, intuitively do. And I really encourage you the next time you drive your car or you're in a car to consciously think of the number of decisions uh, and the amount of processing that you're doing in your head without even noticing. Uh, notice how you're thinking about the car to your right, the cars that you see in the, uh, in the mirrors, the cars, the sounds that you see and you're processing around you, uh, conditions, whether you see a car kind of entering your lane and how you behave afterwards. All of this, uh, the AV or the autonomous vehicle will have uh, to maneuver safely and smoothly. Uh, so let's start with obstacle detection. So here, obviously, the task is object detection. You draw a number of bounding boxes and you have a number of classes that you want to uh, that you want to encounter and you also want to include in your uh, in your model to be able to uh, to, to capture <clears throat> Now a big challenge that to me was actually fascinating to, to realize and you would face this also with any other task of object detection But it becomes even more important in AVs due to safety is that you have the same performance or relatively same performance for objects that are near the camera versus objects that are further away from the camera. So you can already see, uh, because essentially all of these are just a number of pixels uh, on your screen. Um, so here, let's assume this is about seven pixels to 10 pixels wide, while this vehicle here is about 40, 50, or maybe 70 pixels wide. So it's easier for the model to capture bigger objects, and it's much more difficult for the model to capture with relatively good accuracy, smaller objects such as this. Uh, and that's the bigger challenge for obstacle detection in autonomous vehicles. Obviously, the data needed for this is bounding boxes and the various classes that you have. Now, a layer deeper than obstacle detection, no pun intended, is uh, traffic sign recognition. And the challenge here is that you would have hundreds of classes of different traffic signs. In fact, what, when it, last time I checked, uh, this model at NVIDIA in the US alone was handling 300 different traffic signs, and in Europe was 200 different traffic signs. So that's 500 traffic signs in total. Now, if you imagine, you can't just uh, slap a, uh, a softmax function at the end of your, uh, of your, at the end of your uh, neural network that would just predict across 500 classes. Uh, so the way the team did this is actually use a hierarchical approach, where first you would look at a sign, you would try to classify its uh, shape. Is this sign a circle? Is it a rectangle? Is it a triangle? Because the shape then would represent uh, a different meaning. Uh, circle could mean speed limit. Uh, a, a triangle could mean a hazard. A rectangle could mean just information. Uh, and then you could go into different subclasses of information and then use another uh, neural network or a different layer of your neural, neural or iterate on your neural network to be able to tell uh, for example, the color, and then so on and so forth, until you get to predict the actual sign that you are looking at. So again, it, it seems like a relatively easy task, something that we've done in non-AV contexts probably, uh, but when it comes to, to, to the AV context, you start to see the subtleties. The other thing, imagine that you're running down the highway 
at 100, 120 kilometers an hour. And uh, the, the vehicle will need to capture these signs and predict and do these, uh, this hierarchical classification in a split second uh, for your safety. And this makes it another, adds another layer to the challenge. Now let's look at path perception. And this is one of the um, also important tasks that the vehicle needs to do. Uh, it needs to be able to tell where it can drive safely on the road. So what you see in front of you is actually a mixture between object detection and semantic segmentation. So in object detection, it might be obvious uh, this uh, for path perception, it's actually just detecting the lane markings. So it's seeing where are the lanes, uh, lane markings for the road. And it's trying to detect also the center of the lane that it's driving in. So you, we see these big uh, green lines to uh, illustrate the center of where the car is driving. And the semantic segmentation is to segment, okay, which lanes, uh, which lane am I on, which lane is to my right, which lane is to my left, which lanes are safe to merge into, and which lanes are uh, not safe because there's something uh, that is in my way or in my blind spot. And one of the bigger challenges of this path perception is when you have a curve along the road. So, so one of the bigger challenges or tests that we would put this model through is what we call the clover, which is essentially a, uh, like the shape of a clover leaf. Uh, and it's like four circles that you would just drive in an infinite loop if you kept going through all of them. But because of the curvature of that clover, it's, it's hard and it's definitely a challenging task for any AV uh, to go through that uh, safely. Great. So now coming to the last model that we will talk about here, which we mentioned before, uh, motion detection. So uh, the task here is obviously object detection, uh, but what you also want to say, uh, predict, as we mentioned before, is where is each object moving to next? So this uh, essentially is a convolutional uh, neural network that was paired with an RNN, a recurrent neural network, uh, and what you're doing and training it on is the frames, consecutive frames uh, of a video. So it's not just one image, but actually a, a sequence of images that you're feeding into the network. So then it can learn and predict where are the objects that it's capturing moving to, uh, or think where are they moving to uh, next. So here we can see that, for example, this car is detected and this is its current position. The network is predicting that its future uh, position will be here in a few uh, frames. And this would probably be the next second or two, uh, or maybe even less. Now the challenge here with, was that this model uh, obviously uses a lot of data and requires um, a long time for training. Um, I think this should have said long training time, not large training time. But uh, um, so, so to put it to scale, uh, I would say our smallest model in AV was actually the sign classification model. It would take typically a whole day to train. Uh, other models that were relatively uh, bigger, but still considered small, would take two to three days. Uh, the average was a model would take a whole week to train on a full data set. And this model, the RNN model, would take probably two weeks to train. So this is a lot of time, a lot of GPUs that you're taking up as well. And now if you take up these GPUs for training, uh, your colleagues aren't using them to test their models or train their models. So it's really an infrastructure challenge as well when you're developing AVs. It's not only uh, let's get up a neural network and let's get it working and put it in the car. There's also, let's say, a AI infrastructure logistical challenge that goes with it as well. So uh, this Sorry. Kind of brings me to the... Sorry go ahead. for interrupting, but no, go ahead. I just want to tell you that we are running out of time. Like we have eight minutes before. Okay, uh, I'm actually at the eight. end. Uh, so uh, I'll actually finish with closing thoughts and uh, I'll share the video with you. You can watch it at your own time. So my, my three thoughts on AVs. First, uh, I, I truly believe it will create new jobs. Yes, there are some jobs that are at risk. 
um, especially in the trucking industry. Uh, but it will create new jobs like data labelers, technicians that we need to calibrate uh, all of these sensors in the vehicle. Uh, of course, model developers, data engineers, uh, software developers, and so many different jobs that, that would be needed in this industry. Um, I hope through this presentation, I was able to show you how the scale of autonomous vehicle development makes it a very, very challenging task. When you're talking about uh, data, raw data at the petabyte scale uh, that you're trying to select from and label and then train your models with thousands of GPUs. And lastly, I wanna emphasize this point again. Uh, this is a clear problem. Uh, by clear, I mean well-defined problem. You want to build a car that can drive itself safely, smoothly from point A to point B, but it does not have a clear answer. Uh, there's still uh, a lot of work going on, people trying different approaches. You've probably heard about the uh, feuds in the AV industry of Tesla not wanting to use LiDAR, and almost everyone else uses LiDAR. Uh, everyone's trying a different approach and trying to get to the same answer, which is having a safe, uh, smooth ride in a uh, self-driving car. Uh, thank you all for listening. I truly appreciated this. The, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, this is my email. Feel free to contact me uh, if you want to collaborate on something together or work together in the future. And this is my Twitter handle. It would be an honor if you follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much. Happy to answer your questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was an interesting talk. So, I think. Uh, Hassan, you are mute. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, now it's uh, the time for you guys to interact with us. If you have any questions regarding the talk, and you would like to, uh, to ask it to our speaker, uh, feel free to uh, leave it in the Q&A Q uh, box below. Uh, we'll be reading all your questions and uh, redirecting it to our speaker. Uh, we'll try to uh, answer as much questions as possible. Uh, this uh, Q&A uh, session will uh, take from 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, let's, uh, okay, let's get started by the first question we have today. Uh, is this through the chat box, Hassan? Yeah, through the Q&A uh, box. Uh, okay. Okay. There okay. are some questions in the chat uh, submitted by Adrian Khalid Shehri. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, get started by the first question we have uh, today. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any frameworks for uh, self-driving cars? Uh, and if so, which one do you recommend? Uh, okay, uh, so frameworks, if you mean a framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, there isn't one dedicated for self-driving vehicles. Um, we've used both internally at NVIDIA, TensorFlow and PyTorch. The majority was TensorFlow though. Uh, for no particular reason, but because we built many uh, tools around the TensorFlow uh, framework uh, that we would then use uh, tools like a data loader or estimators or uh, models or mar model architectures that would then become templates that model developers could use. So that's why the majority was TensorFlow, but there is no particular framework. Uh, something that I would point you to is there are open autonomous vehicle data sets that you could use to start development. So Waymo produced, I think, released a set, and there are a couple of few more, um, more data sets that I saw out there. Um, so I hope that answers your question. What, okay, thank you, Yahya. I'm trying to read through the questions to do like a fire round so we can go through them. So if you don't, yeah. what does it take to build or bring AV to Saudi Arabia? Was that going to be the next question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so as long as we're looking at the same thing, let me know if there are other questions that I might have missed. So to bring AV to Saudi Arabia, you would need rules and regulation. You will need testing zones. Uh, you will need data, uh, data collection efforts and data labeling as well. Uh, you will need people like you. Uh, and I know Radwan, I've seen your work on Twitter. We need you to work on this and many other excited individuals. Uh, all hands on deck by Saudi men and women to, to, to bring this home. Uh, I can tell you, alhamdulillah, because I work in government, that there is government effort to, to have an AV strategy. Uh, I don't want to disclose too much, but maybe when that government body is ready to talk about it, they will. 
uh, but there is effort there, which is exciting. And I also want you guys to know that each time I'm in any one of these sessions, I always mention societies or groups like PyData or Saudi Data Society uh, or Community uh, or Data Geeks as groups that these government bodies should leverage and build on because I truly, truly think your work is awesome. Okay, uh, moving to the next one. Uh, what about AV industry in our country regarding jobs? I think it's a similar question to what I just mentioned. I would just add that I see that there's room for jobs for technicians. I see there's room for jobs as data labelers. I see that there's room for, of course, model developers, data collectors. There's a lot of room and opportunities for jobs, in my personal opinion, as Yahya Khoja, not as a government official. So I don't want to get into hot water or trouble. Uh, okay, so uh, are there other questions, okay. Hassan, or? There are yeah, some in the, yeah. in the chat from Adrian and- Yeah, Hunter. I have those open as well. I just want to make sure that I don't skip anyone. Uh, so, uh, yes. okay. How do you handle uh, yes, annotator- you questions in the chat. Oh, Go ahead. In the Go chat? Ahead, uh, yeah, yeah, in the chat. Okay, yeah. so annotator disagreement, uh, again, that's why, that's exactly why you want to have a clear manual and data labeling instruction, so you do not have annotator disagreement. In fact, you do not want the annotators thinking subjectively about how they should or should not annotate data. It should be, in a way, something that is more habitual rather than uh, an active uh, task, which is why this is challenging to retain people in this position. And of course, that's why you have managers. Uh, and lastly, we also had a full team of software developers, UI developers, uh, designers and UX designers, and a product manager only working on the software tools uh, that the data annotators would use to annotate the data to make it an easier experience, make it more intuitive, and they would, the data factory was in India, so that team would travel to India uh, every now and then to meet the data labelers and do actual customer interviews. And of course, they would have weekly calls with the data factory to listen to any complaints. How many GPUs do you usually use to train the models? I would say four on average, uh, mainly because, as I mentioned, on the contention in the data center between different model developers, people would typically ask for four. Uh, some people were nice, they know their model isn't big, they would just use one, which, and we love those people. But some people we know needed to use eight models, uh, eight GPUs, uh, so that's a full, uh, full DGX, uh, NVIDIA DGX, uh, which is a lot of training time. Uh, and now we're working towards um, distributed uh, training, so then we can also ramp up beyond uh, eight. There were also DGXs that have 16 GPUs in them, but I've ha I have not seen someone use 16 GPUs to train some. Any news, NVIDIA, uh, any news on NVIDIA's ML Tensor specific hardware? Uh, the latest news is NVIDIA releasing its latest architecture called Ampere, uh, and that's what they, and I think they've used that to train their big NLP model, I think called Megatron, uh, which has an order of billions of parameters. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at that paper. I think that was impressive work, uh, or paper or blog post. That was impressive work that they did there, uh, and it's quite interesting. And Khaled uh, al-Shihri, can you please comment on energy and autonomous vehicles? Will they charge, discharge autonomously, sell back to the grid? Uh, I know this is, okay. Uh, so that actually I do not have uh, a lot of information on, unfortunately. Um, I am not sure if the vehicles are charging autonomously or not yet. Uh, I actually, <laughs> I remember seeing a Tesla video. The, the funny thing is, if you want to charge autonomously, you would need uh, something to plug into your vehicle to start charging. And I think that in itself was also a challenging task. It was also a kind of freaky sci-fi like video <laughs> that, that kind of freaked me out for a bit. Okay. Any other questions? I think I got yeah. through the ones that I was able to see. Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, a question. Go ahead. Uh, does simulation make uh, the labeling task uh, much easier? Uh, is that one of the advantages of using simulation? Because you have uh, more control uh, comparing to the uh, real situation. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so, it, um, so to make it clear, simulation is not a substitute for real data. It, it, it is helpful in testing. Obviously, you don't, need to, you don't need to label that data because you created it yourself, uh, which is helpful. But you cannot depend on simulation data alone. Um, Google, Osset, NVIDIA, and many others have used 
billions or drove millions of miles on, on simulation data, but that's not enough. But I think the best thing about simulation is that you can specify the conditions in which you want to drive the vehicle. So let's say you don't have enough data in the rain, so you can create more rainy scenarios and test the car in those scenarios and see how it performs. Um, however, that brings me to another, let's say, uh, interesting point. We did have some efforts of self-labeling data internally at NVIDIA. And uh, that, those aren't very broad. We could only use those for particular models that use certain data sets. Uh, let's say they use only the odometer data or GPS data and whatnot. So that data we could actually self-label. Uh, it's just stitching information together uh, and use that. It was not image data uh, and not raw footage necessarily. So, uh, so, 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 so that that way, the the labeling cost for that model was not that difficult. Um, so, so yeah, that that's how we tried to go around labeling intelligently. But labeling is definitely a bottleneck in the whole process. Okay, I think we finished of the question. Thank you again, Yahya. It was interesting talk, and thank you for answering all the questions.